I had the honor of attending both sessions of the Synod of Bishops dedicated to marriage and the family. When I read Amoris Laetitia, I recognized the fruit of our work during those two synodal assemblies. However, the fourth chapter surprised me by its novelty and originality. The meditation on love that it offers us is, for me, the great and beautiful surprise of Amoris Laetitia. This is probably the chapter where Pope Francis expresses himself most personally in a style that is his own, both familiar and profound, easy to read, but rich in content. Here we hear clearly the voice of the pastor who is close to his people and understands the daily reality of couples and families. Whenever I present this encyclical to people, I invite them to discover it by first reading chapter four. So what do we find here? This chapter can be divided into two main sections. The first presents a meditation on the hymn to charity from chapter 13 of St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The Pope chooses to comment on verses four to seven, which constitute the very heart of this hymn. These verses begin with the famous words, charity is patient, charity is helpful, and they end by naming four characteristics of love it excuses everything, believes everything, hopes everything, endures everything. I would like to raise two points here. First, there are hardly any footnotes in this first section. This is certainly an indication of its originality. And my second point concerns the word charity. In the Bible, it is used to translate the Greek expression agape, which means unconditional free love. It designates the love that comes from God, a love that transforms all other human loves, whether friendship, passion, or parental or filial love. In his commentary, the Pope explains how each characteristic of agape, named by St. Paul, can invite us to examine ourselves to check on the quality of our concrete love for someone. For example, in commenting on love is not jealous, he writes, True love accepts that everyone has different gifts and different paths in life. It allows them to discover their own path to happiness, allowing others to find theirs. Another example, speaking of love that excuses everything, he writes, I do not require that the other's love be perfect to appreciate it. He loves me as he is and as he can with his limits. Love cohabits with imperfection. These two examples demonstrate how the Pope's meditation is anchored in reality. Without idealizing love, he invites us to engage in it radically, for he sees in it the path of true human flourishing. The second section of chapter 4 begins with paragraph 120. In contrast to the first section, it abounds in footnotes, mostly referring to either the great medieval theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, or to the series of catecheses presented by St. John Paul II in the early 80s, often referred to as his theology of the body. This second section, which we might call growing in conjugal love, is developed in nine sub-themes. One, love seeks to give itself totally. The Pope reminds us that a couple's love is like a reflection or an icon of God's love for us. This is why love by its nature tends to faithfulness, permanence, and fruitfulness. Two, love is open to joy and beauty. The Pope explains that when one learns to consider the other in all the dimensions of his or her being, one discovers that person's inner beauty and is open to joy. And he reminds us, moreover, that the joy of this contemplative love must be cultivated, even in the heart of trials and suffering. Three, love seeks a framework, a structure that will enable it to be solid and to last. This is what marriage offers, not a prison, but protection and help in maturation. Four, love must always grow, evolve, and deepen. The Pope explains how three little expressions, please, thank you, and sorry, can foster this growth by creating a space of generosity and respect. Five, dialogue and communication are essential for love to last. 
this is not self-evident because each person has his or her own personal way of communicating that must be learned and appreciated. He reminds us how to give ourselves time to listen with patience and attention, to make sure we understand before offering our opinion. Six, love produces desires, feelings, and emotions. In short, passions that must be received positively while learning not to become enslaved by them. It is therefore necessary to educate our passions in order to channel them and bring them to perfection. Seven, among these passions, we find eroticism, which, when it is healthy, enriches the wonder and humanization of sexuality. It is a gift from God that embellishes the spouse's encounter. However, sexuality can also undergo perversions, especially when linked to selfishness, manipulation, or violence. And here the Pope recalls that all forms of sexual submission and domestic violence must be rejected. Eight, Love can be embodied in the conjugal relationship, but it can also be expressed in celibacy, which is not superior to marriage, but complementary to it. Nine, finally, the Pope addresses the question of the duration of love. Over the decades, appearances can change, feelings can evolve. Still, love will find other ways to express and reshape itself, not only to be preserved, but to flourish. The Pope concludes the chapter by stating that only the fire of the Holy Spirit can consolidate the couple's love, direct it, and transform it in each new situation. What can I say in conclusion? Simply this. If there is a part of this long exhortation that all the world's couples should read, I think it's chapter 4. Whether one is a believer or a non-believer, the Holy Father's wisdom schooled in the Bible and in tradition, enriched by his experience and reflection, his prayer and his meditation, presents itself to us as a true lesson about love. I invite you to give yourself the gift of reading it, slowly, attentively, like a letter that Pope Francis wrote to you personally. You will find in it breadth, life, and inspiration for your life.